And my father, he was, uh, he and my mother traveled, uh, from Ireland uh, because of the potato famine. You see, the English, uh, that's another nation, that's, uh, the one that Jesse come from. Uh, oh, they yes, was, uh, them. uh, they come in and they buy up a lot of land and they, uh, take over much of my country, the Ireland, and they force people to work. And uh, even people that own the land, they forced them to work. And they was uh, pe- not feeding them or allowing them to eat as much of the food that was being turned out of crops. Many farmers went bankrupt. They, 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 didn't, uh, they lost all their money. And uh, the land was not producing a good yield. And people were starving to death. I mean, it was, uh, it was real bad. There's not as much this game. sounds much like our reservations at times. Hmm. Yes. Uh, very similar, I would say. Uh, I think that's why part of me understands a little bit about how uh, your people is uh, plight in some degree uh, because of that experience. And mm. in my hometown, Dingle, uh, my father told me that, uh, that the, the town started to transform from being a, a farming community over to being a fishing community. And uh, while my father was a good farmer, he was apparently a, a terrible fisherman. And uh, he didn't fare too well. Uh, ended up getting a boat run aground and sink. So all of our money got tied up into that. And what he had left, he was able to parlay into a couple of tickets uh, on a, a boat to get us over here to the, to the new country. And, uh, well, that's where we ended up in Georgia. At the time, so. Ah. The George is a state to the south. Uh, it is far to the south and east and the east coast. The only Georgia I have met is the woman named Banks. Oh, yeah, I yeah. Him. heard that name earlier This was not today. what you meant. No, no, it is a, it is a state. When people used to call it the country, uh, it's, a lot has changed in the last 50 so years. But uh, people used to reference their states as their country, you know. Virginia, for instance, is another state out to the... A large state out to the uh, east. People used to say that was their country. You know, your country was your home. Virginia was people's home, or in my case, Georgia. Mm, so this valley would be my country. Right. Ah, the same thing. It would be a similar thing. Uh, things have changed a lot ever since the Great War. I don't know if you know about that. Mm. Oh, yes, I know the war. This was before I was born. Uh, well, I'm a little older than uh, the two of you. <laughs> no, hopefully that it's not offensive. Uh, but, um... Grandfather ducked this war. There you go. Thank you for this. Yeah, yeah. And uh, coffee for you as well. No heroin. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we'll try it this time, this way. <laughs> thank you. There you go. Thank you. Uh, some people prefer to put milk in it or what have you. Myself, if I just drink it straight. I like the taste of it oh. enough. This is like a uh, very, very, very strong tea. Yeah, I guess that's a good way to put it. It'll warm you up though and give you a little pep in your step. <laughs> mm. well, Someday uh, I will learn to make this thing. A lot of people died in that, uh, in the war. I was, uh, it was a. Uh, it was a stupid young boy when I was. When I was young, I was impetuant, and intolerant in my youth. You don't know much of this war. My grandfather told me of men in gray uniforms that patrol through our territory. Leave them alone, though. No. 
man. You rent that story now? I'll tell you. This is up to you, for there are your words to share. Well, when I was 13 years old, after uh, landing here in Georgia, my family lived for a while uh, north of the city of Atlanta, the foothills of the, uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's the calm down. It's a good farmland, lots of good, uh, lots of good places to a man could uh, earn an honest living. When the war broke out, there was a call for people to join up. A lot of fellas went. And the war was only supposed to last a few months, but... Uh, well, I got into an argument with my father. Who I guess I was being a... Uh, well, a child. And then uh, my father, when he... Uh, He was pretty tough with me. And it was, uh, but this was pretty good, you know. I don't remember the words he had then, but I remember feeling like he didn't believe that I was a man. That I could be a man, that I was going to grow up to be a man. And I wanted his respect. I always wanted my father's respect. So I left the home. And I joined up. I was a tall kid, so even though I didn't have the same muscles and such as a grown man, I was still tall. I could pass myself off as 16, maybe 17. And they was in such need of soldiers at the time, they, well, they took me in. I served with the 24th Georgia. And we saw the... Uh, well, Learned a lot of things. A lot of terrible things. Hmm. There is a... There is a place back east known as Fredericksburg. It's the place where I would see the elephant, as they say. Well, this means that uh, where you stare death in the face, determine whether you run or do you stand and fight. Old Cobb, or uh, the person that led us, the chief, if you will, the small chief, he pulled our regiment up behind a stone wall on the top of a like a, a, a stone wall that was behind a sunken road. And uh, in front of us lay a long, slow slope downward towards a sleepy town known as Fredericksburg. It was uh, December. It was weird called the uh, start of winter. Uh, the boys in blue uh, fought for the town and then the following day they Pushed their way up one at a time, up onto the hill where we was, uh, we was held up. Well, because uh, the fellas I was with knew I was younger. They had me in the back. I could load real well, you see, load a gun. Oh, I was loading rifles and passing them back up to the front. The fellas in front were standing there over that stony wall, pouring hot lead and Con and fire down into the lines of blue, feathers wearing blue, coming up the hill at us. Most of them, the lines would melt away in a long groan at one time. The bullets in the first shots rang out. Sounds of cannon fire, screaming overhead, whopping large holes in their lines. They'd take a volley or two, and then they'd fall back. It 
It was then that uh, we saw some fellas later in the day come up after us. They was flying the flag of my home country. A green flag with a golden harp on it. We call it the flag of Aaron. Aaron Gabra. Long live Ireland. And the fellas that we'd be killing were Irishmen, like ourselves. Come from our home country to settle in our, our new homeland. And there we were that fateful day, standing across each other, across the bloody space in between, killing each other. Eventually, they uh, they pushed forward. It was not more than maybe a uh, hundred, hundred and fifty feet from our line. You could see the eyes of the fellas, and the man in front of me got shot in the head. And I uh, pushed forward to the wall. And I grabbed a musket and I held it real tight. And I looked across that expanse, and time seemed to slow down. And that's when I pulled the trigger and I saw the fella that I shot. And the look on his face as he fell. They took several volleys, the Irishmen did. They made it as far as anyone, our former countrymen, fighting for different sides new war and when we was when they pulled back when they fell back it took a lot of casualties I think I don't know how many of them we killed but it was a whole bunch and we shouted back to them Aaron Gabra we waved our own green flag not one of us had dry eyes tears were all abound as we knew what we had done it was not in short a murder. Mm. Yeah. This country and made you fight your brothers for their own benefit. No, we chose to do it. Like I said, I chose to join into the fighting. I was stupid and young and wanted to prove that I was a man. Later, it, I like to think that it became about something more meaningful. But I was young and foolish. When night fell, after all the fighting stopped, there was nothing but a long groan over the, th in the night, so just the, not the normal silence that you would hear at nightfall with the animals and all. It was eerie, so nothing but moaning and people crying out for their mothers, their fathers, horses. There's a couple of fellas, one in particular, that uh, since has returned the title of the Angel of Mary's Heights. He was crawling over the wall and taking water out to the wounded and the dying men that was laying out there in the field that cold night. And while they was bleeding out, not a, no one could help him. And he bravely crossed the expanse, the deadly space between... Uh, to give comfort to those that had fallen. Next morning, well, the armies separated from each other and came time to deal with the wounded and the dead. And I, uh, I'd been wounded myself. A mini ball hit the wall that I was on and fragments of the stone come slashing up through my face. And, I still carry the scars to this day. 
But I uh, found the fella that I looked in the eye, the first man that I killed. I found him that morning, the mist. I took from him, uh, well, I took from him this photograph. And there you see the, uh, the lovely lady that's sitting down in the chair beside uh, this fella. That fella there, he's the, uh, he's the fella that I shot. That's what he looked like, that man. The lady that's sitting beside him, I would come to find out, was his sister. I, uh, after the war, I spent a lot of time, well, dealing with things about the war and all, best I could. About ten years later, I was in my early twenties, and there's an address you see on the back of the photograph, and it leads to New York City. And I decided that what kind of man would I be if I didn't, if I didn't go there and tell that lady that I was the one that shot her son, her husband. So I did. You can imagine what that conversation must have been like. Mm, yes. She hated me, of course. So did the whole family. When I stayed in New York City after I did what I did, I worked odd jobs, doing a little bit here and there, and making money as I could. Sometimes getting involved with the wrong crowds. I was kind of drifting, if you will. My, uh, my boat uh, didn't have any moorings. It was just cast out on the sea with nowhere to go. Just the wind to take it. Eventually, I, uh, I happened to meet some people that, uh, that knew of them. And we uh, met again a few years later. And so we ended up talking and becoming friends, her and I, and eventually she forgave me for what I'd done to her brother, and uh, we would continue to see each other, and she would become my wife a few years later. <laughs> it's funny how the world works sometimes. Yes. And I, uh, we were married and happily married for a long time. I copped getting myself into trouble in New York City, and the city life really wasn't for me. I, uh, arranged it with a family member of hers, a distant cousin, to, uh, be able to go out to a farm out that they owned out in the uh, western part of uh, New York State. And, uh, there we'd get out of the city, I'd get away from my troubles. I tell my wife, Mary, she didn't want to go. But she did it for me, you see. She knew that if I stayed in the city any longer, I was probably going to end up dead or something else. <coughs> so she, uh, she agreed and we moved out to the, s to the cabin and out to the farm. And, uh, well, unfortunately, she, um, she cut the pox real bad that winter and she uh, would get her and she passed. And that was about uh, well, five years ago now. I am sorry. Uh, yeah, do not be. I mean, we lived a very happy life, her and I. Yes. He has spoken of her with such love and devotion. It makes me happy to know of their time together. Mm. 
Would you like to hear the story I have to tell to you? Oh, yes. I'd love to. Now let me, uh, let me sit here. Hey. Alright. it's probably best to just sit on the ground, huh? Of course. It is about the simpleton's wisdom. Once there was a man and his wife, and they had but one daughter. The mother and daughter were deeply attached to one another, and when the daughter died, the mother was unable to uh, deal with this. She cut off her hair and cut gashes in her cheeks, and she sat before her daughter's corpse with a robe drawn over her head in mourning. She would not let them touch the body to take it to a scaffold to bury. And she kept the knife in her hand, and if anyone offered to come near, she would wail. I am weary of life. I do not care to live. I will stab myself with this knife and join my daughter in the land of spirits. Her husband and family would try to take this knife from her, but they could not. And they feared to use force, for she has said she will stab herself. So they came together to see what they could do. And after much talking... They decide they must get this knife from her somehow. And then they call upon a boy, young and simple, but uh, very shrewd. He was an orphan boy and very poor. His moccasins had holes in the soles, and he dressed himself in smoked coarse buffalo skin. And they tell this boy to go to the teepee of the morning mother and figure out some way to make her laugh and forget her sadness, and try to take this knife from her. So the boy agrees, and goes to the tent, and here he sits at the door, as if waiting to be giving something. The daughter's body lay in a place of honor where she had slept in life, and it was ripped, wrapped in a rich robe, and it had ropes about it. Her friends had covered it with offerings out of respect for her, and there the mother sat on the ground, with her head covered, so she did not see the boy at first, and he sat silently for a time. But when he began to come bored, he used his hands to drum against the floor lightly, and then a little heavier and heavier as time went on. And then he began to sing a little song, louder and louder, until he became carried away and began to dance as well. And while he did this, he would gesture and make all manner of contortions with his body while singing his little song. And then he came before the daughter's corpse and waved his hands over her in a blessing. And this is when the mother sees him and pulls her head from the blanket. And she sees this poor little simple boy with his strange grimaces trying to honor her daughter with his solemn waving while singing his song. She burst out laughing. And then she reaches over and hands her knife to him. Take this knife, she says. You have taught me to forget my grief. If while I mourn for the dead, I can still laugh, there is no reason for me to despair. I no longer care to die, and I will live for my husband. So the boy leaves the teepee and brings the knife to her husband and family. And they ask him how he gets this, and if he has forced it from her. Or did he steal it? And he looks at them with a smile on his face and says, She has given this to me. I could not force her or steal it when she held it in her hand with the blade upright. But I have sang and danced for her and she has laughed. And then she has given this to me. And the old men of the village council hear this story and go silent. It was very strange that he had danced in a teepee where there was mourning. But it was stranger still that the mother would laugh before the corpse of her daughter. And the old man sat long in council, saying nothing, for they did not want to make this a hasty decision. They filled their pipe and passed it many times, until finally one spoke. We have a hard question. Hug back to you there. The mother has laughed before the corpse of her daughter, 
and many think she has done foolishly, but I think she has done wisely. This boy was simple and has had no training, and we cannot expect him to know how to do as well as one with a good home and parents to teach him. But he has done the best that he has known, and he has danced to make her forget her grief and try to honor her daughter by waving his hands. The mother did right to laugh, for one, one does try to do us good, even if what they do causes us discomfort. We should always remember rather the motive than the deed, and the simpleton's dancing has saved her life, for she has given up the knife, and in this too she did well, for it is always better to live for the living than to die for the dead. <laughs> Ah, that is a good story. Yes. That is what I used to tell my wife all the time, is uh, that I felt like life is not about weathering the storm, because God knows I learned I weathered many storms, whether they be filled with lead or just time outside, and I had no shoes or what have you. Well, it's not about weather in the storm, it's learning how to dance in the rain. Because it's going to rain in life all the time. <laughs> 